Welcome everybody to the UDR podcast. I'm Tom Forsyth here with Bill Ward. We're going to discuss everything recovery, different perspectives and different experiences in recovery with people we know and people around the world. Today we have Mike G from Ontario. We're super excited to have Mike on this episode. His story is truly inspiring. He's a real success in the program and in recovery and in his family and what a story he has to tell. So listen up and enjoy. Ready? Okay, Mike, how's it going, buddy? Good, no, good, good. You're, uh, you're here live with me and Tommy on our UBR podcast. Um, thanks for joining us here today. I know you're out in Ontario. Um, you got sober in Regina, I understand. And I know that because because I was a part of your early recovery, and I've been a part of your recovery for for your whole life. Um, so yeah, Tommy and I are honored to have you here and uh, and see what type of life you used to live, hear it, and and what you're living now. I know that you live a very content life today. I know that you're getting married, or you just got married, sorry. Um, your stepfather, you're, you're a father to, to Angel, your daughter. Um, your relationships in your life are all good. And I know from the beginning of your life and your using career, that wasn't always the case. So today we're gonna talk to you about, you know, what it was like, what happened, and what it's like now. But Really, what I'd really like to, to, some of the turning points in your recovery of what happened through these difficult times, which, which made you go the harder way, because you've done a lot of things the easy way in your life, and you got to a point where you got sick and tired of being sick and tired, and you wanted to do something different. You know, I know Tommy and I have been through pretty much the exact same type of thing that you have done, and we consider all three of us consider ourselves as members of fellowship of the spirit We're we're trying to live the best we can with God's guidance. Um, so I just like to, you know, hear, hear what are some of the major turning points that, that you've had to go through to get to where you are today? Well, um, I started out in the family of being the oldest boy of four kids and, uh, a lot of alcoholism and violence and abuse in my family, um, I took to running away. Um, at 15 years old, the year, that year, my parents had separated that summer and my best friend had uh, committed suicide uh, that September. And I couldn't take it anymore and I had, wasn't using yet. Um, so by that time, I ran, I bolted, and it gave me some relief. Running away gave me some relief. And I, I was always coming back. And then I picked up some substances, starting with alcohol, and then I changed flip-flop from one thing to another over the years, but continuing to run. And that continued until, well, I was 48. I went to my first AA meeting when I was 16, 17, and I went through about five, six different treatment centers. And I was always looking for the easy way out, the quick fix, the, the, the instant gratification. And it never worked. And by the time I was, I think, 38, my uh, girl I had met got pregnant. And my daughter was born. And even that didn't give me the... the uh, as in the 12 and 12, I had no anchorage to any permanent values at all. Um, it was just easier to take off. And this time around, and, and I always hear this in meetings and I just roll my eyes. It was different, but it really was. Um, I, for one brief moment, standing outside of a homeless shelter in Regina, Saskatchewan, which I've stood outside of approximately 90 of them across Canada over the course of 32, 34 years, whatever it was. For one brief moment, I had met um, 
my who the man who was to become my sponsor at a meeting in Regina. And he just looked at me and said, are you done? Have you had enough? Do you want to change? If you do, there's a way. And I'm standing outside holding this phone number that he had given me and thinking about my daughter and realizing for, I could just see where I was for one moment of clarity that I couldn't go on this way anymore. And I was given an out. I was given a way out. It was like, do you want to change? And I had been to enough AA meetings. I had struggled for a year at a time to stay sober a couple of times. But in the big book, Alcoholics Anonymous, where it says, few to whom this book will appeal will be able to stay sober anything like a year. I wasn't even going to live a year, right? Let alone two weeks. Um, so I was standing out there and this God of my understanding that I had turned my back on when I was eight years years old because of the abuse in my life I looked up to the sky and said okay I'll do whatever this guy says it doesn't matter what it is I got to do it and I called and the bastard laughed at me right when I called I said hey Bill it's Mike uh, from Ontario I'm in Regina do you remember me and he went yeah I remember you <laughs> I said I'm ready I didn't ask him to be my sponsor I didn't ask him to take me through no steps I didn't know what to ask him I just said I'm ready and he said if you're ready do this until I get back right and that began the journey of, of change. But it was that moment of brief moment of clarity where I could see where I was. Because we can kind of look back and we have this idea of where we come from and deluded as it may be, I had an idea of where I wanted to go maybe, but I'd never really seen for any real clarity where I stood at any given moment. And that moment was enough to rock me, enough to ask for help. When you, went to your first AA meeting years and years ago, and then you had continued in the fellowship. Um, what type of messages were you hearing? Or what type of messages weren't you hearing? Was, was the program that you were attending, was it solution orientated? Or was it diluted? I'm just trying to get a picture because I know you ran in and out of rooms for years and years. Were you not listening or was the message not strong or can, can you tell us what the program was like while you were trudging through? I think I met two guys over the course of those years that I would refer to as guys in the fellowship of the spirit. I think two guys. I would often hear things in meetings like, you know, uh, just don't drink come to meetings, right? Get a book, don't drink, come to meetings, get a sponsor. That was all I would ever hear. Um, but there were two guys. One guy like called me on my crap and I just bolted and wouldn't talk to him anymore because I didn't like people like that. And another guy um, did the same thing. So mostly I'd never really heard the word humility in a meeting. I, it may have been said, I didn't hear it, right? Um, the first 164 pages, I'd never heard that. It may have been said, but I remember being in a meeting in Hamilton, Ontario, and there was a speaker meeting and this guy was talking about the steps, right? And how they had related to his life and changed stuff. And I was just like, yeah, yeah, whatever. That girl over there is cute. Um, but, well, you know, show up late, look for a date kind of guy. And uh, I remember the, the, the rumblings after the meeting about who this, who does this guy think he is? and you know, but I didn't know anything about it and I didn't really care, right? I, I, what I cared about was Mike and how everything was affecting Mike. What I cared about was where was I going to sleep that night? What I cared about was how come I didn't have a nice car like the guy who rolled into the meeting? I, I, it was all about Mike. I really, what you could have told me, you could have laid out the program on a silver platter for me and I would have probably ran away from it. I would imagine. I don't know for sure. I'm not God, but. Like you, I was a treatment center guy, but you referred it to it as the easier, softer way. In my experience, I didn't understand that it was the easier, softer way at the time because I just didn't know what to do. So I kept going to treatment centers and then I would, you know, sober up for a little bit, but then within a week or two, I'm drunk or high and I'm running away from life again. Um, can you explain a bit why it is the easier, softer way now that you have the knowledge you have today? Well, back then I thought it was easier, softer way because, well, 
when you're homeless, it's a 28 day program. So you get fed for 28 days and they help hook you up with an apartment, will help you get place and welfare and everything afterwards. So it was the easier, softer way. Now I realize it wasn't the easier, softer way. AA is easier, softer way. Following the directions the design for living in the big book Alcoholics Anonymous is easier, softer way. It's difficult at times. Well, what the dividend, both will pay dividends, right? Going to treatment and half-assing it and doing it my way pays crappy dividends, right? But it's it's less it's less work, but it's a lot more pain. The little bit of pain I've had to go through, and I'm going to call it a little bit. Like, is it hasn't been really, what have I done, right? I've written out a bunch of pages in a step four, shared them with a gentleman who I've learned to trust, and then wrote out a list of people that I'd harmed and really delved into how I'd harmed them, right? Like really delved into it. And then I've set forth and started to make those amends. Other than that, it's nowhere near as difficult as trying to figure out what I'm going to take with me when I'm bolting out of town mm -hmm. and where I'm going to eat and sleeping in a freaking porta potty. Right. Um, you know, it's way easier to go, going the AA way. Yeah, it's, it's amazing how much effort we put into our addiction and then we bitch and moan when we have to come in and, and do this stuff, which is not, like you said, it, it's, it's simple, but it's not easy. And you have to be at a point where your mind's open enough to accept the message in the book. And I, at that point is different for everybody. I went through a ton of pain before I got to that point. And, you know, what, at what point did you all of a sudden have that glimpse of enough openness to, to actually take this stuff in? Well, I think when you meet when the student is ready, the teacher will appear, right? And I think God had it orchestrated for me to run into a guy who I'd never met this type of person in my life, right? In an AA meeting who was brimming with self-reliance, right? Because he relied upon God. So he was standing there and, his, and I'm going to quote the book. His old deportment shouted, right? I'm a man with a solution, right? When I listened to this man share in meetings, I was like, whoa. He's talking about like real deal stuff and, and a solution to this real deal stuff that he's gone through. So I wanted that, right? I didn't so much want his higher power because I remember the first time I was in his truck and he told he was talking to his daughter about what his higher power was. I was like, that's weak, but that's my judgmental self-centeredness because I realized really quickly after that. Dude, like, what are you, a moron? This guy's say, helping save your life. He's giving you the directions that are going to change you, and you're sitting here judging his higher power? Like, you're a moron, right? So I, these things were easily pushed aside for, for the desire to get what AA had to offer because he was taking me through this book, and I was seeing things, right? Like love and tolerance, true freedom of the human spirit. I, I was looking at this stuff going, what the hell is that? Right? Like, what is this stuff? Like, I, you know, when it says not even a nodding acquaintance with humility, I didn't have a nodding acquaintance with anything. I didn't nodding, didn't even have a nodding acquaintance with the honesty, right? Like I was a, I was a mess. So the, the turning points were, were, were coming fast and often. Um, the willingness was coming faster and more often because I heard this said in a meeting and it makes some people crazy, but you don't have to believe that the directions in the big book, Alcoholics Anonymous will work for you. You don't. You just have to be willing to do them. And if you put the action in, it's like baking a freaking cake. You follow, you want grandma's cake, she gives you the directions and you follow everything, put in the ingredients that she says and follow it, put, put the oven on. You don't, you could think you're making a tuna salad, but when you pull it out of the oven, you're going to have a cake just like grandma, right? That's what you're going to have. Like, you don't have to believe it, just do it, right? And, and I started to see that because I would pray and the answers would come. I did my fourth step. And, and I remember sending my sponsor a text. Remember you told me that these, these promises would come true if I did the work. And he couldn't respond right away. So I did what he told me. I went to my room and I prayed. I got on my knees and I said, God, give me the willingness to continue on this. And it came. And I started to write again. 
And then I got a text from saying, you yeah, effing idiot, I told you it would freaking work. <laughs> but it, it does work, right? It's just, but without Herbert Spencer, back of the book, right? There's a principle which is a bar to all knowledge, which will keep a man in everlasting ignorance. That principle is contempt prior to investigation. If I know it won't work, it won't. Yeah, bro. <clears throat> I remember sitting with you in Regina in a house that I was renting. And I had asked you, are you actually willing to go to any length? And you had said yes. And I, and I wanted to put you to the test. And we had started reading some of the chapters out of the book. And you had fallen asleep. And you were sleeping while I was reading. And then you realized you were sleeping and you woke up and you were like, no, no, I'm awake. I'm awake. Let's keep going. And I, and I, I had to say, you know what, Mike, it's all good, bro. Let's jump in the truck and get you home. And at that point, your home was the Sally, Sally Ann. And then you were all worried that I was going to, I don't know if you were worried that I was going to drop you or, or fire you or whatever, because you were sleeping which you might have thought was you're not willing. But to me, I was like, no, this guy is willing. He's willing to do whatever it takes. He's even willing to, to fall asleep with me doing this work and then jump up in shock thinking that he needs to get back to work in this program. And I knew that night that you were probably going to do what it took. And as we worked together and, you've proved that you were willing to do what it takes. And there's a couple stories that come to mind. Uh, one of them is, is when you were going to go get your license. And we always talk about in this program, the pains of trying. Okay. The pains of trying are the certain penalties of failing to do so. And this program is hard. And I always say, do what's hard and make your life easy or continue to do what's easy and make your life hard. And that experience that you had to go through with your uh, license and you were just starting to rely on God, you were just starting to implement prayer. And, but I think God knew that you wanted to change and you were showing God and you were showing yourself that you really did. And, and, and some miracles happened for that day. Can you, can you elaborate a little bit on, on that day and those stories? Oh, on April 23rd, we started this work. Uh, on May 9th, 18th, 2017, my driver's license expired and my Ontario health card expired. And to keep this little job that I had doing road construction, I had to get a new driver's license. And uh, I didn't have a birth certificate or any valid ID. And uh, it was looking grim, but I was walking up Broad Street and I, I had been given the directions to pray. So I was walking up Broad Street and I was just like, okay, God, give me the strength and willingness to face this no matter how it turns out, whether I get the license or not. If I, if I don't get my license, it means I'm not supposed to have this job. So I went and walked in and I laid out what I had for the lady at SGI and she said, I can't help you. And I was like, hmm. So I was, I was doubtful. Um, so I, I prayed and I, I looked at her and said, is, is there anything I can do? And, you know, like swear an affidavit in front of a justice of the peace or something. And she just looked at me and went, wait a minute. She went in the back. She came back out and she goes, do you have a, a criminal record? And I said, I have a couple of minor things. And she said, well, if you can get a criminal record check, we will uh, give, use that in lieu of ID. So I went, walked down the police station on the way there. I said the same prayer. Like, Lord, just give me the strength and willingness to face this, no matter how it turns out. Whatever is meant to be is meant to be. And I walked in, told the lady at the police station, and she's like freaked out because, you know, they can't ask you for that. It's private information. And I just said, ma'am, I burned my life to the ground. I'm living in a homeless shelter um, to keep my job. If I get a driver's license, um, they're trying to help me. And she said, okay, well, she took my money and I grabbed a seat. She called my name. I went up. She handed me my envelope. And I was walking back to the, the police station. I was like, thank you, God, you know, and, and however this turns out, it turns out. And I walked in and the lady said, oh, you got your thing. And I opened the envelope and the $45 for the criminal record check and the criminal record check were in the envelope. She didn't charge me. 
Um, that was the last $45 I had. I was living in a homeless shelter. Um, and the people at the homeless shelter were treating, they humanized me. They, they, were, they were treating me like a person. They were coming to the bank with me and I would give them all the money I made because I owed the money and they would give me, oh, no, no, Mike, you need to buy coffee and cigarettes and they give me money back. But I, that was my $45 for my coffee and cigarettes for two weeks. And it was like, to get it back was kind of, you know, for a smoker, that's a blessing, right? And, you know, for a coffee drinker like me, that's, that's pretty cool. And at that moment, I knew that I was going to be okay no matter what happened, whether I get the driver's license or not, whether, whether I keep this job or not. God, I sincerely taken the position that God was the director now. Um, and it hasn't been easy, but it has been made my life a lot easier. Like, there, there's so many of those stories that, uh, that have happened, you know, that road construction job, like maybe three weeks later, I got offered a job at the homeless shelter as a maintenance man, right? And as I directed, I did what I was told to do. I prayed and then I talked to somebody, a person in Alcoholics Anonymous who happened to be my sponsor, who's had a spiritual awakening, who can give me some advice. And there is no question of what that advice can be, right? So... I, I asked him and he said, ask yourself one question. Where can you be of maximum service to God and the people about you? Is it making temporarily a whole bunch of money or is it, you know, having your life grounded in a job where you can help people? It was a no brainer. I think that what's so important from what you just said there is the like the blind faith and the, the prayer without expectation and how powerful that is leaving room for God to do his work instead of saying the prayer and, you know, expecting a certain answer. And I did that for a long time. I would pray and then I would expect it to happen quickly. Um, but when you get into a, a zone of, you know, of the unknown and, you know, I don't know what's best for me and whichever way this goes, like this is the trust in God that, that is so necessary that we learn as we start to <clears throat> release a lot of the things that block us from God, because, um, you know, if we, if we continue to focus on our future and it needs to be a certain way all the time, uh, we're going to be let down and something happens when we let go and we just say, I don't know what's best for me. I need help and I don't know what it looks like. There's a, there's a, there's a power in that. And then things start to fall into place and, you know, I can't plan the outcome, you know, and we start to have this trust in this higher power that, you know, doesn't make any sense. And when we explain it to people who don't do this type of work, it doesn't make any sense. And then things in our life start happening and it's like, you know, yeah, of course, you know, this is what happens when we're, when we're open. And, you know, we don't, I don't know everything today and I don't need to. And then I have less worry and anxiety and fear because I'm not worried about my future because I know it's taken care of already. And I- Dr. Selkworth wrote about the, the gentleman who, uh, the last gentleman that he, he writes about in his, in his second letter that uh, he's the finest specimen of manhood as you'd ever want to meet. Um, because he got sold on the ideas in this book, right? When I went through that with my sponsor early, that's what I wanted, right? I wanted that. I wanted to have that self-reliance and I wanted to have that ability to just be okay. And it was, I had to find out what the ideas are in the book though, right? I, I could make that connection. So as I'm going through this with my sponsor and he's highlighting things for me, and he's asking me, do you understand this? I'd be like, no. Or, or I think I understood. And I'd say what it was. And he'd say, well, maybe it's this. What do you think? And then we'd talk about it. And I was getting the ideas in the book really quickly. And I was like, okay, I got to implement this now, right? Because it says sometimes uh, takes some of us a long, long time, right? Now, Bill could have just put a long time, but a long, long time. Well, I don't want it to take a long, long time. I want to be like in the back of the big book in the spiritual experience where it says, um, 
Uh, what happens in just a few months could never have happened with years of self-discipline. I wanted that, right? I wanted to hammer this into me because my sponsor told me, bring God in quick or you're going to die the way you are. So anyway, sorry. So you had mentioned earlier in your story that you had a pretty harsh prejudice against God based on your upbringing. And in the big book, it talks about do not let spiritual terms deter you from honestly asking yourself what they mean to you. How did you navigate such a heavy prejudice against uh, a forced upon God in your life to a place where you could have a God that you could work with? Do you, do you have anything on that? Well, for me, it wasn't a heavy prejudice. It was a huge resentment. Mm. Um, I wasn't forced to go to church as a kid. I was the only one in my family that went to church. I was seven years old, getting dressed in the morning, putting on like, well, the nicest crappy clothes I had and walking through the snow up to the Catholic church. And I would be talking to God. Like, I'd be like, God, this has got to stop. You know, make him quit hitting my mom. Make him quit hitting me. You know, make him stop making me sit in a car for four hours having a Coke in a, in, a, in a chip while he's supposed to be fishing and you know all this stuff wasn't stopping so I got mad at eight years old and I just I'm done with you but I wasn't really done because every time I was in trouble I do the Monty Hall prayer let's make a deal right um, you know you get me out of this one and I'll never do that again or if you get me out of this I swear I'll continue to do this and he always kept up his end of the bargain and I didn't and I was able to see that by going through this book with my sponsor and realizing that God has always been there. He's always been there. It's just in his time and in his way. It's a selfish self-centeredness. That self-seeking, when I went through it, it's in, on page 62 where it says selfish self-centeredness, self, self-pity, self-seeking. I, for some reason, underlined self-seeking three times because I knew everything I ever did was to self-satisfy Mike. Every time I ran was to run away from fear so Mike would feel better. Everybody I stole from, every girl I lied to and tried to bed down, everything that I ever did was self-seeking. And that, to me, was a huge one. And so when I realized that if I asked God to help me get rid of that stuff, and he did, and he continues to, because the, the, the growths or handicaps are gone now, right? That I'm not going to steal any money from you. I'm not going to try and sleep with your girlfriend. But now it's the cast, casting a glance at a girl at the gym or, you know, do I really want to pay? Yeah, I got to pay the full price. And, you know, to get rid of those little gnawing things now is what I'm working on. But that self-seeking was the one, right? That was what kept me from God, trying to make myself feel better all the time. So as you walk your way through your recovery and, and you start feeling some of the benefits of this blind faith that Tommy had mentioned about trusting God, and by the sound of it, you relied heavily on, on your sponsor and just doing what you were told. Um, so it brings me to the benefits of actually having a sponsor that is working this program and walking the walk in this program. Beginning of the book on the forward to the first, it talks about to show other alcoholics precisely how we have recovered is the main purpose of this book. So it sounds like your sponsor was actually showing another alcoholic precisely how he recovered, not only from the, from the substance, but also from the bondage of self. And, and you saw that working in, in his own deportment. His deportment shouted that he is the man with the real answer and he was happy and things were going well for him. Um, how is it important is it to have somebody that understands the program and the directions in the book versus having a friend who lives in the theory of God or the theory of the program and have you experienced the two separate items? Well, uh, to me, they're, they're not even the same thing. You, you're, you're talking about two different worlds. Um, having a sponsor who, who's gone through the process of the 12 steps and realizes if he had anybody who's gone through the actual process of the 12 steps is going to know that that is the answer, 
right? You have to carry this message. It's not even, it's not even a have to, it's you're going to, you're going to want to. Why wouldn't you? Like, and somebody who hasn't gone through the 12 steps can't help me. They may help me um, get a job. They may help me find a girlfriend. They may help me with an apartment, but they're not going to help me with the real deal stuff that I need to maintain an apartment or a job or a girlfriend or, or a life period. They can help me with the external things, but recovery is not an external thing. It's an inside job. It comes from the inside out. So it's two different worlds. It's like, it's like having a friend and a doctor. My friend can give me a Band-Aid. A doctor can diagnose the problem and help me get better, right? So it's, it's two different things. It's like um, a friend is a friend and we all need friends. Um, most of my friends are based in recovery though, are, are based in, in solution-based living. You know, God-centered people, people who, who have a solution and are willing to share that solution. Do you see that being uh, a hurdle for people new in recovery that come to rooms? Do you see that there's a watered down version going around that, that is diluting what we're actually trying to do? Or do you believe that it's, it's supposed to be that way? Do you have an opinion on, on that? I know it's a, sounds a little judgmental, but my opinion- oh, I didn't see, they, I don't know because I have a, a guy I know in Saskatchewan still alive and says, this is as far as I'm going, right? Openly admits, this is it. I'm not going any further than this. This is it. I said, okay, well, you, you do you, right? I said, and I was honest with him. I said, dude, you live in resentment. You're angry and you're miserable. And, you know, and I'm telling him, but for a newcomer coming into the rooms, some rooms to me are not AA. They're, they're listed on an AA program and you can find them on the AA website, but they are not AA because what came first, the, the book or, or this worldwide fellowship, the book? How did, it get, how did AA meetings get their names? From the book, right? Alcoholics Anonymous is, is laid out in a lot of people will say the first 164 pages of the big book. Um, well, if you've got a first edition, it's the first 179 pages because the doctor's opinion was a numbered chapter, but you know, split a hair, it doesn't matter. The directions are there and the directions tell me right from the doctor's opinion, right to a vision for you that I have to carry this message. I have to. For my own recovery to work, I have to carry the message. Um, no, the, the traditions came later, the concepts came later, and so did, I don't know, watered down AA, but the different AA, right? It's different than it was. When you look at the numbers and the, 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 the positive turnout when AA first started in the 30s, 40s, 50s, and then treatment centers came in and then things started to change, right? Because AA is not the same as it used to be. Whether it's supposed to be this way or not, I don't know. All I know is if I want the AA that I was shown and I want others to have it, I better carry this message. I better go to any room I can anywhere and carry this message that AA is outlined in the big book, Alcoholics Anonymous. And, you know, I can shout that, share my experience. This is what's happened, right? And you're allowed to share yours whether you agree with me or not, you know, I've had guys, you know, walk out of meetings cause I shared, I've had guys, you know, share right back at me and, you know, and, and, and it's fine. Like at first I was angry about it and I was hurt and blah, blah, blah. And now it's like, okay, I have a solution. It's right here. It's carefully hidden in the big book, Alcoholics Anonymous in the chapter. There is a solution, right? It's right there. There is a solution, a solution to what? The solution to the problem of Mike my selfish self-seeking self-centered destructive behavior my thinking it's right there quite as important was the discovery that spiritual principles would solve all my problems all of them not one of them not just the drinking problem because you can set aside the drink problem and i can tell you why i was making a heavy going of life right life sucked even when i wasn't drinking when i didn't have the 12 steps in my life 
Well, yeah, I mean, and it, it's a it's a design for living. It's not a design to just apply this stuff into certain areas of your life. It's like asking God, you know, I'm going to hang on to sex and finances, and you can have the rest. Um, it just doesn't it doesn't work that way. And yeah, like why do you why do you think it is that people get, you know, bent out of shape when you speak? the message as it is in the book. Like, where do you think that's coming from? I think the spiritual axiom is anytime they find something disturbing, the problem lies with them, not with me. Like, really, it's like when they share their opinion, I don't get bent out of shape. Like that's, you know, I, I've come to realize that if they are honestly seeking God, the realm of the spirit is all inclusive, never exclusive or forbidding, right? It's, it's there for everybody. We're all at different points on this beam, if we're honestly seeking, right? If we're honestly, if I'm not, well, like Bill said earlier, you know, I suffer the pains of trying or the certain penalties of failing to do so, because I will drink again. If I'm not honestly seeking to the best of my ability, and sometimes I'm way left to center, right? Not as far left to center as I used to be, thinking that I, back in the homeless shelter, when I was right in my step four and I woke up one morning, called my sponsor and said, dude, God spoke to me. I got to buy a plane ticket and fly back to Ontario and start making my amends. And he <laughs> talked me off the, the edge, right? He's like, okay, bro, where are you going to live? Well, I'm not, how are you going to make money? Well, uh, so I'm not leaving now. He's like, well, it sounded like you're buying a plane ticket. And technically I was thinking about it, right? So, you know, sometimes I'm way left to center. Sometimes I'm just a little left, you know, sometimes I'm on center, but we're all on the path and we're right exactly where we're supposed to when we're supposed to be there so if i'm disturbing somebody in a meeting and they're getting all bent out of shape well sometimes the best we can do is take a loving and tolerant view of others eh? Mm -hmm. so i mean can't be can't be i'd love to be useful to everybody all the time but i can't be all the time i mean part of the reason why we do this podcast why we do what we do um and i i was a victim of you know going to meetings and hearing a watered down convoluted message of you know you don't really need to work the program and bring it into your daily life and you know i saw guys being sober and you know their life looked pretty good and they didn't really have to do like the directions in the book and apply it to their life day by day and then but that for a guy like me that doesn't work like i, I need this stuff it's my lifeline and I need to rely on a higher power and I need the directions in the book to keep my channel clear to that higher power. Um, but what I didn't understand was like, I thought I was working the program by going to meetings and praying only not really sponsoring guys. Um, Cause I thought maybe, you know, I wasn't, I didn't really need to. And I was watching other people do it, but you know, that was good for them. But there's a, these other people that are doing it a different way that looks more appealing and it is this easier, softer way, really. Well, like you said, this is the easier, softer way. It just doesn't look like it. I, uh, I was uh, guilty of going to meetings and hearing some of these people saying this stuff, right? Like, uh, 90 meetings in 90 days or, uh, and, and I, I, I met a guy in Regina and, uh, we're referred to him as angry. Mike is another Mike. And, uh, you get 90 days and you go back out and you get 90 days. And after the third 90 days, he's like, I don't see why I keep going out. I'm going to 90 meetings in 90 days. And, and it dawned on me, like it's today, right? I'm working on today. I'm not working on 90 days. I'm not working on 10,000 days. I'm working on today. Another person in Regina asked me at six months, what's your one year going to look like? I said, can I get through today first, please? Like, like, you, I start living in tomorrow or yesterday. I'm, 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 I'm cutting myself, selling myself short. But a lot of these messages that I'm hearing in AA, like, uh, you know, okay, don't drink, go to meetings, and you'll be okay. No, I won't, because <laughs> I did that. I did that, right? No, for me, it's not going to work. I need more, right? Another person, after I started my amends, persons like sober, maybe 25, 26 years, um, a bunch of us from a GA meeting went out for supper after, and it's a place where they serve alcohol. 
And I was only sober four months, I think. I started my step nines. And apparently that's a little too quick. Um, he's like, freaked out on me on the phone. What the hell? You're going to a place they serve alcohol for you? could have had a drink. And I remember thinking, wow, sounds like you still got an alcoholic mind. <laughs> but I didn't want to be overly judgmental. So I called Bill, my sponsor at the time. And he said, uh, well, yeah, like, what would you have done if they brought you the wrong drink? Well, I would have sent it back and asked for the right one. Like, like I had ceased fighting at that moment. Like I was, I, I wasn't okay, but I had ceased fighting. I'm not in, I'm not going to be like freaking out over little things. Like, and that to me was like, well, okay, it's the wrong drink. Like, but I was spiritually fit at that moment to go to that place. Right. If I'm not, then I'd better work with another alcoholic or, or go to a meeting or do something, you know, like, cause there were times I went to a gratitude meeting and I'm like, I'm, I'm at the gratitude dinner. I'm looking around. There's like 200 people. Like never seen any of these people at meetings, you know? So I got annoyed and I called my sponsor. And he said, what are you going to do? I said, I'm going to go to a meeting and find a newcomer. Right. That's what I did. I went to like the Saturday night meeting in Regina and there was a new guy there. Like, thank you. And I sat down and I talked to him. Right. Cause that's what made me grateful. And you had mentioned something. Listen to the bunch of people telling me how grateful they are because they got. You had mentioned something about anger and you had talked about angry Mike, um, 90 days drunk, 90 days drunk, 90 days drunk. And he's like, why can't I stay sober? <laughs> what am I doing wrong? In the big book, it says, you know, um, resentment is the dubious luxury of normal men. Um, anger has to be dealt with and through the 12 and 12 and the big book anger is a non-negotiable it has to be dealt with you know one willful snap judgment or unkind tirade will give me the reason without me even thinking because I'm defenseless against the defect of character first and I'm defenseless against the drink. And unless I use God in the defense of the drink, I'll drink. And unless I use God in defense of the defects of character, I will still act out in defects of character, which is why step six is so important, right? Any person capable of enough willingness and honesty to try repeatedly step six, working against my defects of character always, on all his faults without reservation has indeed come a long way spiritually. So to you and to me and to Tommy, we get it. It's much more important to try to bring God in, in the moment where we're disturbed and ask God to help us and, and then talk to someone immediately and try to get some counsel on our situation. And, and relinquish these serious character flaws that made problem drinkers of us in the first place, flaws which must be dealt with, or we retreat into alcoholism once again. And really alcoholism is, is me living in resentment, me, me living in fear, me living in anger, me living in my head and self-seeking and, and trying to run the show and manage everything. And, and that's much more important, right? Uh, can you speak how maybe step six and step seven have, have really played a part in your spiritual growth and, and what those two steps mean to you? Well, to me, it's six and seven start back in two and three. Um, when, I'm, when God's becoming the director, when he is the principal, I am the agent, he is the father, I am the child. When I'm starting to look at these character defects and I'm writing them down in four and five, okay, that's great. And then I get into eight and I'm looking at like the real, the real deep reasons of the harms that I've hurt people, why I've hurt, how I've hurt people and making it right. In six and seven, that, that continually changes for me because all of a sudden now, it's not just the fear I'm asking to get rid of or the anger I'm asking to get rid of. Now I'm looking at the real causes. Why, why do I feel I need to be in control, right? Why do I have that delusion that I can actually have control, that I can rest happiness and satisfaction out of life because I can't. The only time I'm truly at peace is when I'm trying to seek and do God's will. So I have to ask for that stuff to be removed. 
because if I don't, I can't be open to what God's will is. So at first I wanted the lust to be gone. So I didn't have to hire prostitutes anymore. Right. And then I wanted that stuff to be gone. So I wasn't watching porn anymore. And then I wanted that stuff to be gone because I don't want to be just like treating ladies like pieces of meat, um, money. Right. When I, when I go to bed at night now, I've asked God to remove those defects enough. I thank him for what I don't have because what I don't have, he doesn't feel I need it. Mm. Right. I don't need a brand new truck. And you know how I know I don't need one? I don't have one, right? If I, if I needed a new house, the opportunities would be there for me to do the action to have a new house. So six and seven are where I really start to look at God in that way where, like I think Tommy says it sometimes, like he's not a Bush League pinch hitter anymore, right? He's the starter. He is the show, right? He is the deal. So I'm now looking at the things about Mike and saying, got to get a little deeper, right? I had a guy call me and say, I was angry at my wife because I'm self-centered. Mm, yeah, but more so, what's the root of that real problem, right? Like, let's get a little deeper, right? At first, I didn't go that deep because I wasn't able to. I think that in recovery, if everything would have come to me, that's come to me at this point at three and a half years, my head would have blown up. I just cleaned <laughs> off. Like I wouldn't have been able to handle it, dude. I couldn't handle, I couldn't handle making the decision whether I was going to ask the front desk for new socks or not. Right now, the decisions I'm making are first world problems. Like, well, should I put gas in the car today or wait till tomorrow? Kind of deal. Like, because I have a car. Right. This is this is like, I'm not sleeping in other people's cars because they forgot to lock the doors today. Right. So like so things have changed in six and seven i remember having a discussion with my sponsor he's like oh the deal is six and seven i was like well it's all about 11 and and i i, I love this because we're playing pool in south end Virginia. he's like well step 11 just says we sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with god as we understood him praying only for knowledge of his will for us and the power to carry out six and seven and we're, shut up like <laughs> But but the longer I've been around, the few days that I have now, I'm starting to realize, yeah, six and seven are like, yeah, they're major, right? As well as eight and nine. If, if, if I stop after five, and it's easy, I've seen for people to stop after five, because they've got some relief. They don't feel like, they feel like they've dropped the bag now, right? It's like, oh, yeah. But if nothing changes, nothing changes. And that's when it really starts is in six and seven. That's when I'm taking, I'm having a whole new look at God's world, right? I'm starting to see it. And if I want to get a true gl gl glimpse of his kingdom, like what it really can be once in a while, I got to do this stuff. Mm -hmm. So we, uh, it tells us we have to let go of our old ideas and, you know, we're born in a state of God-like, you know, like full of love and joy and then as we go through our life, we're programmed by everything around us to be a certain way. And we get all these ideas and these behaviors. And I think six and seven fucking nails that. We start to see like how I've de developed certain patterns from my father and my mother and my grandparents and the media and the people I hung out with. And then six and seven brings me to a place to start to look at it as, well, what is what of this is mine right like how much of this is actually who i am who in god who, who god intended me to be and then you know i start to discard some of this stuff and and this is where i start to feel freedom i think i mean it starts in five the heavy ones that are glaring at me but all the little stuff and it, it tells us like it's it's what separates the men from the boys right the guys that are really willing to dig in and start to really fucking discard some of this stuff that doesn't belong to us, but it, we're comfortable with it because it's been ingrained in us. And then all of a sudden, when we start to let go of some of the stuff, we start to be free and, you know, more connected to God. And I, it's, I, it's important to do this because I mean, even if you go up to the step 11, if we don't get rid of a lot of this stuff, it's really hard to connect through prayer and meditation until we've actually cleared the channel, right? So. In five, in four, in four I, I stopped the blame game, right? Start looking at my part, what I could do differently, 
what fancy fears I've developed. And then in six and seven is where I get to kind of go, yeah, that pattern, like growing up, I think by the third year of grade nine, um, and yeah, I said third year of grade nine, um, the, uh, I've gone through like 10 different schools, right? Because my parents moved a lot and we weren't in the army. And I've never asked why we moved a lot. It doesn't matter. We just moved a lot. Um, so once I picked up the drink and started treating my alcoholism with the alcohol and the substances, I picked that and went nationally with it. Like I, I since recovering, I've uh, gone back to college and I took a social work program at the local college and uh, we got sent on a seminar four hours from here, beautiful hotel. One of which the only time I'd ever seen was picking dry butts out of the back of the employee ashtray. But uh, this time I'm inside and they got a room and it's really nice. And the guy tells me how many homeless shelters there are across Canada. And then I sat there while he was still talking, I was doing the math and I have been to almost half of them, right? So during the break, I went up to talk to him and I said, is there really like that many homeless shelters? He goes, yeah. And I told him how many I'd been and he goes, okay, which ones? And we got to talking and because this guy knows about the deal of homelessness and substance abuse, right? And the connection. So yeah, like there's, there, it's about picking up, looking at those patterns in my life and seeing that it's nobody's fault, right? I picked these things up and chose to use them because I thought they worked. And I tried with all my might by every form of self-deception experimentation to keep them working, right? Because of the fear of changing it and trying something different. And when the fear of trying something different became less than the fear of continuing to do what I was doing, nothing was going to change. And when that happened, boom, it was like everything was lined up, right? Here's the guy shouting out with, here's a solution. This window opened, I was helped through it. Then another window opened and I was helped through it. And those windows were closing behind me. And if I want to reopen them, I just got to stop doing what I'm doing, right? I'll get right back through every single one of them and probably a few more, right? Most likely a few more um, until I'm dead or I come back, one of the two. Those are my options as far as I can see, you know, because I'm going to die an alcoholic. I'm going to die an addict. That's a given. Do I want to die a clean, happy, joyous, and free one? Or do I want to die the way I was? That's my choice today. That's what the 12 steps have given me. The ability to utilize that power of a God of my understanding so I don't have to live that way anymore. Right? That, that I have, I'm able to look people in the eye. My wife knows when I tell her what I'm doing, she knows that's what I'm doing. My daughter is now 14. Four years ago, her father was a nationwide missing person. She had no idea where he was. She was full of anger and fear and guilt and remorse for something she had no control over in the first place. Yet today, she says, I'm her best friend. She trusts me. That's Alcoholics Anonymous, right? That's God of my understanding. That's got nothing to do with Mike. Well, you had mentioned uh, a reestablished relationship in the chapter... Um, on amends, step nine, into action. It talks about there is a long period of reconstruction ahead. I always like to point out that the, the long period of reconstruction ahead isn't me reconstructing so much the relationship with people, going around and, and resting happiness and satisfaction, trying to reestablish all these relationships. The long period of reconstruction is myself. And through the reconstruction of myself with the new foundation, the old foundation was built on self and it fails me. And I build on a new foundation of, of God. The cornerstone is the foundation and it's God. And through your new foundation and these relationships rebuilding, you've had a lot of really awesome things happen in your recovery. I know you've spoken at some pretty big gigs I know you've uh, developed some, you know, pretty strong relationships with, with a lot of different people and you've gotten numerous opportunities for, for jobs and, and new experiences. Can you share some of the, the gifts of, you know, reliance on, on God and the program that have come to you over the last few years? Oh, and it started right from the get-go. 
like I mean right from the get-go like following the dictates of a higher power but first we, we talked earlier about okay a sponsor is here to show me these directions and also to be the big book I've never read right he's carrying this message by the way he speaks by the way he acts the, by his life right so this is I'm seeing a big book right here and then he's saying here this is how this happened for me and I'm going wow I'm getting sold on this stuff right so then I start asking God for help and when I do that it says when we sincerely took such a position all sorts of remarkable things followed now I'm doing things like living in a homeless shelter and after one month, they put me in my own room and I'm doing things like cleaning my room, right? Because I'm told to do things differently, right? What I normally would do, just leave that unmade, who cares? Nobody's, nobody else lives in here but me, right? My laundry can be done later, you know? But here I am getting up at 10 after four in the morning to go to this road construction job, to come home to uh, a cold supper, and a half a meeting, because that's all I got time for. And then my sponsor picks me up and we go in to read and I'm falling asleep while reading. And then I still get back and make sure my room is clean, right? Because I'm told that if I want things to be different, I got to do things differently. And then I got a few days off of work because they're changing jobs. And one of the caseworkers at the shelter comes to me and says, we did a room inspection thing. Like, okay, I got nothing to hide now, right? I'm not hiding drugs, I'm not, if my room's clean, it's like, great, good, good for you. And they said, uh, is that a Bible on the end of your, your, your nightstand there? I was like, no, that's a big book. What about that other one? No, that's a Daily Reflections book. Do you read those? And I was honestly able to smile and say yes every day, right? Every day. And the lady says to me, there's a job opening here. You should really apply for it. You'd be perfect for it. Now, this lady knows nothing about my history. She doesn't know that I know how to do drywall or plumbing or, or even read a measuring tape but I'd be perfect for this maintenance job because I clean my room and I read the big book, right? That's, that's at, in a homeless shelter, a guy who cleans his room and reads the big book, I guess is a pretty rare deal, right? I don't know. I, I guess I'm the only one she's ever seen. So <laughs> I get this job, right? And now the guy who was my caseworker is now my coworker. Okay. This guy is my coworker. Now he was the one, who was responsible to make sure that I paid my rent and, you know, didn't hang myself in my room at night. Right. That's, this is the guy, right. He's got to keep an eye on me. Now he's my coworker. Then we become friends. And then God sends me to live here in Ontario. So I'm here to be with my family. The guy sends me a text about a year and a year and a half ago and says, uh, do you really ask God every morning how you can be of use to other people? This guy's part-time job. He's a pastor at a free Methodist church. Right. And I sent him a text back. Don't you, you're a pastor, right? You would think that's his job, right? To, you know, and the next day he calls me and says, will you take me through the big book? Will you be my sponsor? Because he saw the guy go from bed 41, who I was to the man who I am today. He witnessed it firsthand. He had never seen anything like this before. I'm lying in bed 41 in the dorm. The police come in. And I keep it real quiet and because it's the police. I thought there was a warrant out for my arrest. Um, the next day when I went to his office and said, bro, we got to go to the police station. I think there's a warrant out for my arrest. I can't live with any dishonesty in my life. And he just looked at me like I had just grown a third eye. What do you mean you guys? He walked me to the police station, right? And I walked in and took a number and gave them my ID and they ran my name. And at that moment, I was praying, God, give me the willingness to accept this no matter how it turns out. If I got to do time, I'm going to do time. I don't care. I can't be this guy anymore, right? So the gifts are the, the willingness to face everything and all the little treasures that are bestowed upon me, like being 40, 50 years old for the first time getting a car. Um, my daughter telling me she loves me and trusts me. Um, I just got married on July 4th. Um, Congrats, man. Uh, my sponsor heard my uh, sex conduct. I'm blessed to be married. Really, the way I treated women, I am blessed to be married. I am very fortunate. Um, I have friends. I'm on the board of trustees of this youth center. I'm on the board of directors of the local church that I go to. Um, I volunteer at the high school, right? 
nobody wanted me around. Nobody, nobody wanted me around. I was pajama pants, Mike. I was 300 pounds and I smelled like ass. Mm -hmm. And now today I have a wife, I have two stepsons, a daughter. Um, I've just been offered another job, right? At the local high school as a custodian. Um, and my wife is a teacher. Um, so I could have lunch with her every day. It's just, um, I was offered a job in Saskatchewan when I moved back here. They wanted me to go back and open some, help open some recovery homes. And I turned it down because I believe this is where my work needs to be done. This is where my fellow travelers are that need, need to be right here with them. My daughter, my father, my brothers, local alcoholics here who need help. Because when I was out on my honeymoon, my hairdresser sent me a text. She said, Mike, I believe I'm an alcoholic. I need help. Do you, can you help me? On my honeymoon, I called her. I said, I'm going to give two ladies your number. Is that all right? She said, yeah. So I called two ladies from the nearest town and said, look, I, I got a lady here who needs help. Are you guys willing to help her? And they're like, yeah. Boom. Now she's got a sponsor. She's going through the steps. It doesn't matter. Um, if you read Working With Others, right, it says, these are conditions we may have to meet, right? I may have, have to play the Good Samaritan all the time, every day. I don't get to pick and choose who I'm going to help, when I'm going to help. If somebody honestly reaches out for help, I got to be there. And that's when these gifts started to come, right? Like, I, I, I'm driving a new car. Like, three and a half years ago, I was sleeping in cars in a car lot, right? I have a house, um, a home. I get up in the morning, sometimes I look around, I'm in tears because I slept in porta potties. And today, I sleep in a bed with a beautiful woman who cares and trusts me. Wow. What can I say? Like, it's a miracle. It's definitely a miracle, man. It's, uh, that's God working in your life. And wow. I was we're super grateful to have you on today. We do need to wrap it up. Um, yeah, we're just really thankful that you were able to come on and speak so honestly and, and share the miracle of the program and how it's working in your life. Uh, Bill, do you want to add anything before we wrap it up? No, I just want to say thank you, Mike, for your time today. Awesome. Yeah, it's been an honor and a privilege. It really has. Uh, thanks, guys. Yeah, so for more recovery content, you can find me on Instagram, table40.coach. Uh, my web website is table40coach.com and I'm on Facebook at Table 40 Coaching and uh, you can find Bill on all social media platforms and my website at billward.life and Tommy and I also have this EBR podcast together on Spotify and all all. Yeah, we're also doing an in-depth big book study every Sunday online. Um, it, it's at 7 p.m. That's Mountain Daylight Time. Uh, come join us on that if you uh, resonate with anything here today. Um, and you can find the information on our Instagram or Facebook or any social media stuff that we have going on. Uh, Mike, again, thank you so much. It was awesome having you, brother. Bring it on, guys. Thanks, brother. <laughs>